Good morning, John. Morning, Sean. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, project by World Travel Market London and World Tourism Forum Lucerne. You're a veteran on, on environment, conservation, sustainable development. I recall meeting 20 years ago in UNEP uh, when we were negotiating environmental governance in Nairobi. You were Secretary General of CITES for, for nearly a decade and recently appointed to a senior role by the UK government as chairperson of the Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund. So a, a big word, I must get that right. <laughs> You're also a long-time participant in the activities of the World Tourism Forum, Lucerne Think Tank. So I understand this relationship between biodiversity and tourism very well. Maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about your role in the UK government initiative and then offer us some reflections on, on this complex relationship and especially illegal wildlife trade. Great. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for that uh, generous introduction and thanks for your own personal commitment to the whole issue of illegal wildlife trade, but protecting wildlife more generally. And uh, you've been a champion of the cause for many decades yourself. Um, with the UK, they've appointed me as chair of uh, the Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund. This is a fund that was created uh, by the UK following the 2014 London Conference on Illegal Wildlife Trade. And really it was a, a fund established to enable the government to support initiatives to implement the outcomes of that conference. And then there were subsequent conferences in Kasane, in Hanoi, and another London conference in 2018. So this fund there is really to help implement the outcomes. It's all about efforts to stop illegal wildlife trade, but it looks at it from many different angles, you know, livelihoods perspective, from uh, enforcement, demand reduction, et cetera. So a very holistic approach to how we are going to, to stop the illegal wildlife trade. Now, if you look at travel and tourism and the biodiversity balance sheet of, of our industry, there's many positives. But there's unfortunately also some negatives and, and one of those are illegal trade in wildlife species. What's been the progress? How's industry been responding and what more can we do from the, from the tourism industry side? Yeah, so this is a global problem. Uh, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime has now put out a couple of reports back in 2014 and another one just recently. There are around 6,000 or more species found in illegal trade across around 150 countries. Uh, this is a trade that's worth anything between 20 billion and 200 billion, whether or not you look at just CITES listed, which are uh, species that are internationally protected, or species more generally, including those that are not protected, depriving countries of revenue, anything up to 12 billion a year. And it has a huge effect on ecosystem services, including climate mitigation. So this is a, a big issue. It's a global issue. It affects a lot of species worth a lot of money, has a lot of impacts. And the tourism sector both has an impact on illegal wildlife trade, positive and negative. Uh, what I've been very pleased about is how the tourism industry has been stepping up to see how they can help fight illegal wildlife trade. Not only just because it's worth doing, but also it's in the industry's own self-interest because wildlife-based tourism relies upon those wildlife assets. And if they're being stolen and depleted and they disappear over time, the assets gone and the opportunity for tourism is gone as well. So we've seen the World Tourism Forum Lucerne have this on its agenda. We've seen the World Travel and Tourism Council address the issue. We've seen uh, Prince William through his United for Wildlife um, task force address the whole transport sector. So we're seeing multiple entities address this issue. We had a declaration come out of the World Travel and Tourism Council, now over hundred companies there, the Buckingham Palace Declaration on Illegal Wildlife Trade in the transport sector now has 120 companies that signed up. So we're seeing a lot of interest, a lot of activity. Hasn't got everyone on board yet, but I think there's a deep recognition of the interface between tourism and illegal wildlife trade and protecting wildlife more generally and the importance of doing more. So look, the purpose of this series is, is not to name and shame. It's to really to celebrate the success stories, celebrate best practice, because those are the things that you want to scale, that you want to replicate. So I want to ask you about airlines and airports, which is a critical part of this value chain. Um, is there maybe one or two examples that you can share with us of, of airlines and airports really excelling and that's, that's worth following on this? 
Yeah, we've seen uh, International Air Transport uh, Association, the Air Transport Action Group, you know, industry associations get right behind this. We've seen some airports and some airlines uh, get involved, perhaps. The airlines that have stood out for me are airlines like Emirates, um, Qatar, um, these airlines, um, also Etihad, a number of airlines that have stepped up and have been very active in engaging with their staff, with their clients, uh, the way in which they publicize themselves, uh, the way in which they provide an entry point for sharing intelligence. So anything their staff see or hear on the ground, they can share with um, enforcement authorities. So I think, you know, uh, in, in, in that region, uh, with these airlines, Emirates, Etihad, Qatar, we've seen some, some very good progress made. That's not to say others haven't as well, but they're three that have stood out for me. With your past involvement, the current involvement in African parks, and I, you know, it's also very close to my heart, uh, poaching, rhinos, elephants, and some in Africa, a very big issue. Where have we made progress in the last 10 years? What progress is just sort of didn't you see coming? Uh, and, and impresses you today, if you, if you look at, at where we started two decades ago, and, and which species have we made most progress on? Yeah, if I just go back to 2010, in 2010, we were experiencing a surge in legal trade. There was very little political or public recognition of the scale of it and the consequences of it. And in many cases, these were treated as very minor offences, you know, something equivalent to a, a traffic offence. So we were really way behind the eight ball in terms of turning around these trends. I think since then, we've seen a lot of political uh, buy-in and acceptance that these are really serious crimes that have serious consequences. We've seen beta, greater public recognition. We've seen the private sector really get involved. And we've talked about airports, uh, airlines, but the transport sector, the travel and tourism sector get involved as well as others, zoos and aquariums, like the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, and many other sectors have started to recognize this is a real problem. So if we fast forward to today, what we've got is much better buy-in politically through the public, through the private sector. We've seen a shift in thinking to start treating these crimes as serious crimes. We've seen a recognition that we need to protect wildlife at source, but also deal with the demand side. So how do we suppress demand? So we've seen a lot of activity there. We've seen the multilateral system come together. UN Office of Drugs and Crime is now taking this more seriously into Pol World Customs Organization. So we've seen a bit of a shift uh, away from this being a minor thing that's off radar to being seen as a serious issue that is on radar and starting to be dealt with much more seriously. We've had some very good progress with some species, in particular the African elephant, that were really suffering 10 years ago or so. You know, you know, 100,000 elephants killed for their ivory over just a three year period. We've seen fantastic success there, um, in particular in Southern and Eastern Africa, where the poaching and the smuggling has really dropped significantly. Still some work to go in Central and Western Africa, but in Southern and Eastern Africa, really good progress there through collective effort from source through to destination. You know, a lot of good work going on in China, uh, Thailand, elsewhere, as well as in the, in the source states. Well, this Other is species, I couldn't say the same, though. Uh, we've gone backwards with pangolin, unfortunately. Mm. Um, better protection under international law, but since that better protection came into place, we haven't seen any shift. We've seen actually mm. a surge in illegal trade in the meat and the scales of this, this, uh, this wonderful animal, the pangolin. How did COVID-19 impact the supply chains and, 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 and the channel between demand and supply? Yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic has had um, a devastating impact on, you know, on the, on the whole planet in many different ways. Um, and, and as you well know, the, the conservation business model, in particular in Africa, has relied very heavily upon wildlife-based tourism, which has underpinned a lot of the conservation effort and generated a lot of jobs and a lot of revenue. Now, that just fell off a cliff edge all of a sudden from having fantastic uh, revenue and great projections going forward to nothing. So that has left a lot of uh, enforcement agencies um, with less resources, uh, local communities with less employment, uh, less access. For, so it's a real problem. And the next two, three years, as we come out of this, we're, we're going to have to look at other ways of dealing with it. What does it mean for poaching and smuggling? Well, on one hand, it can disrupt supply chains. 
uh, it can perhaps mean there's less money for people to um, spend on illegally sourced wildlife products. Um, but on the other hand, um, as we see um, jobs drop, revenue drop, you know, we could see an uptake in poaching, both for subsistence poaching, but also for illegal trade across international borders. Um, so it, it, we don't quite know yet whether we're going to see a surge or not. What we do know is we have to find other ways of generating employment and generating revenue as we work our way out of this uh, pandemic and the economic consequences, because the, the threat to wildlife is massive. Um, because it's not generating the revenue it was um, pre-pandemic and uh, the land use becomes less competitive. Uh, it just becomes very challenging for conservation. So we cannot discuss this issue without also touching on, on legal trophy hunting and sustainable offtake. Um, always a polarizing issue. Is there a middle ground on this? How do we make sure that, that our conservation also creates livelihoods, that it's about communities and people in nature? Yeah, the critical thing is that local people living within and amongst wildlife must benefit from that wildlife. And that's something that the, the tourism sector and the travel sector has been very conscious of and something that we've been pushing very hard. Um, you know, if, if there's wildlife-based tourism, it needs to benefit local people, not just the investor. So here with hunting, you know, trophy hunting, I don't think there's any middle ground there. I, I think there, it's very polarized. There are those who support and those who are against. Perhaps the only middle ground would be if trophy hunting were to be stopped, if, if that was the trend, that it doesn't happen overnight. Because that is, is unfair to local people who are de deriving their livelihood through legal trophy hunting. You would have to look at a way of phasing it out over time and providing alternatives. That would be the only middle ground I would see because the, the, the two camps are so polarized for and against. But I think we always have to distinguish between trophy hunting and subsistence hunting. So you can also have legal subsistence hunting where local people hunt for protein. And I think we need to distinguish this uh, very much so. Trophy hunting where someone comes in from somewhere else, hunts and takes the trophy back to where they came from. That generates a lot, as you know, um, of... Um, very uh, excited debate and people you know have very strongly held views but the subsistence hunting by local people with a sustainable offtake for protein is quite different and we need to distinguish the two yeah but the only middle ground i would see is um is a phasing out that would be the only middle ground that i could see otherwise i think the two camps are very much entrenched in their positions so john i'm going to conclude by asking you if you had a 20 second elevator pitch to multilateral organizations, governments, and the private sector, respectively. What did that be? At a multilateral level, we need to uh, change the legal uh, architecture. We need to have a dedicated global agreement on wildlife crime, which we don't have yet. We've been relying on upon a trade convention. We need a dedicated um, agreement on wildlife crime. We can do that under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. That's what we need at multilateral level as well as have wildlife trade laws take public health issues into effect. At the national level, treat wildlife crime as a serious crime and uh, identify, protect and invest much more in biodiverse rich places because there are multiple benefits there. Climate benefits, biodiversity benefits, health benefits, employment benefits. At the industry level, don't lose hope, continue to invest in conservation um, and when you invest in conservation with all the benefits it has, including the wildlife tourism sector, don't forget that we have to generate local benefits, decent local jobs for local people if it's going to sustain itself over the longer term. Thank you, John. Much appreciate you making time this morning. Thanks, Sean. Pleasure.